Statistics, confidence interval binomial distribution survey example. Get ready and some coffee because if we want to get futuristic, we're going to need statistics. You're not required to, but if you have access to this OneNote file, we're first a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our crunching numbers is my cardio product line. Now, I'm not saying that subscribing to this channel, crunching numbers with us, will make you thin, fit, and healthy or anything. However, it does seem like it worked for her. Just saying. So, you know, subscribe, hit the bell thing, and buy some merchandise. So you can make the world a better place by sharing your accounting instruction exercise routine. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Currently in the OneNote presentation section, 1970 confidence interval binomial distribution survey example tab, looking at a scenario similar to recent scenarios, except this time, confidence interval with binomial distribution by meaning two, which we will get back to shortly, but similar in other respects in that we're trying to find information about a population, but the population is too large for us to test every item, possibly having more complications as well. We can't get to every item, even if we have the time to do so. Therefore, our strategy is that we want to be taking a sample, hoping that we can apply the findings found from the sample to the characteristics of the larger population to techniques typically used one being hypothesis testing the second confidence intervals hypothesis testing lending itself to situations where maybe we know what that middle point is for example or at least we think we know if it says on the box of peanuts of average amount of peanuts in the box of peanuts, we can build our graph around that middle point, then take our sample and see whether or not the results that we found from the sample are far enough away from the hypothesis in order to reject that original hypothesis. Confidence intervals, by contrast, often lend themselves to situations where maybe we don't know what that middle point is. That's what we're trying to find. Therefore, the result that we get from our sample, that middle point, that mean, will be the middle point, which we will construct an interval around in some way, shape, or form. Could still use hypothesis testing to do so by asking the question of, well, if this is the mean I got from my sample, what if I hypothesize that this point over here were the actual mean of the population? Would my sample result be far enough away, far enough into the tail, if uh, in order to reject the hypothesis? Repeating that question for each of these points, giving us basically an interval which would be kind of like peak to peak, for example. But it would be easier if I can just take my middle point and create a range around it with our curve around that middle point, the curve being basically a normal distribution or possibly in some cases a T distribution, uh, which we might talk about more later. And that's going to be the idea or strategy that we will take a look at this time. Now, note this time we're talking about a binomial distribution and that means there's only two outcomes for each particular test or question. So, for example, in prior presentations, we looked at situations where there's more than two. Maybe you're measuring heights or weights, or maybe you have a survey that was one out of ten, for example, in which case the responses are going to be one through ten. But... You could have a situation where there's only two possible results, such as in a survey, as we will have this time, where we're asking the question of, did you like uh, the streaming service show or not? So we have a modern streaming service show. The survey, instead of saying one out of 10, is just, was it good or not? Did you like it or no? Uh, and obviously these days, most people are saying, no, it's garbage. It's complete garbage. Like, what are you doing? For God's sakes, I'm, I'm watching reruns of I Love Lucy 
and for crying out loud and it's i mean what like with all the technology you have these days can't you just like get a book that was decent and then and then make it cool with ai don't try stop trying to tell stories you guys aren't good at it get an old story and just adapt it to with the ai and modern technology okay so that's the general that's the general idea but the the point for our purposes is that there's only like a yes or no it would be like a coin flip a yes or a no if you're if you're voting for somebody it might be a yes or no are you voting for a or b or you might structure the question such as are you voting for candidate a or not voting for candidate a all right so that's the general idea now if that is the case uh, you will recall or will note that the actual data itself is not going to be in the form of a bell-shaped curve because uh, it's only going to have two bars if we think of a histogram it's either yes or no those are the only two results that we have however we could still imagine a situation that if we took the average of every basically combination of sample and took the average of all that data that it would still tend towards a bell-shaped curve so we can still use in essence our bell-shaped curve in that way the key number is going to be the standard deviation then remember when we have the standard deviation of the sample uh, which is not going to be bell-shaped you would think because there's only two bars to it right we got the standard deviation of the population which also only has the two bars possibly not bell-shaped but the standard deviation of all possible combinations of sample uh, is going to tend possibly towards a bell shape given uh, the central limit theorem but the formula is going to be a little bit different so this side uh, right here this is going to be the formula for the standard deviation which we can call in essence the standard error and instead of it being the standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of n the sample size as it would be if it was not a binomial we're going to take p which is the percent that we're looking at in our case the percent of likes versus dislikes times one minus p which will basically be the percent of dislikes in our case divided by n n being the sample size and we're taking the whole square root of that okay given that we're gonna first be keeping with our with our like movie theme we're gonna tell a better story right now than any most of the modern movies and modern streaming services just on one note right you you can take this one note presentation and just and don't change the script for crying out loud and just put some ai in it and whatnot and you'd have a better tv show than most of the stuff that they're putting out there i, I mean it's incredible anyways let's not get distracted so this is the behind the scenes stuff that we as the viewer know but they don't know in universe they don't know it in universe so we're going to say and we're going to construct our data with this so we're going to say that the percentage of people in the actual population that like uh the streaming show did you did you like the streaming show is only 20 percent we're going to imagine a population of 5,000, which is pretty small compared to you know an actual streaming service but large enough that we can simulate it in excel so we can have the actual population data and then take samples from it and then on the no side of course most of the people if they're honest are going to get paid 80 percent now there's a lot of tweaking of the numbers i'm just making these numbers up but i think it's pretty accurate there's a lot of tweaking of the numbers out there because they pay people they like they say people are review bombing but i don't think they're review bombing on the negative side the review bombers are being paid to say they like the show when the show's no good i think that the review bombing is going the other way but anyways that's beside the point and with that's 80 percent. so 80 percent times 5,000 is 4,000. so we're going to imagine in the actual population we've got 5,000 population and the people that don't like it is 1,000 over 5,000, which is going to be our 20 percent and the people that do like it 4,000 divided by 5,000 is going to be the 80 percent okay so given that then the question is this is a logistical question in excel how can i get my data to show a 2080 split because oftentimes in the past when i've looked at binomial situations i might try to do a coin flip which i could do a 50 50 flip by saying give me a randomly numbered generated 
between one or zero and one or one and two. But it's a little bit more difficult to get kind of a random number around a distribution of 80 20. So, what I mean, a couple different methods that you can think of, and I know this is an Excel thing. And if you want to get into the Excel presentation in more detail, we have another course or section on that. But just to give you an idea of, of the logistical situation to kind of set that up, you could say, let me give me a random number generation between like uh, one and 10. And then you can go through it and say everything that is one through eight, I'm going to imagine is going to be a no and everything between uh, one and two will be a yes. That's one way that you could approach it. Another way we could approach it is to say, well, let me just use these actual numbers. And that's what we did this time. I'm going to do a count of 5,000. I didn't paste them all here, but I imagine that I counted out to 5,000 in Excel. And then I just pasted yes for 1,000 out of the 5,000. And then I pasted uh, and then I pasted no for the rest of them. Now, this is obviously like a deck of cards that has been ordered. It's not shuffled. Then the question is, well, how can we shuffle the deck of cards? Because now we have the proper numbers here for our population. One way is that we could do a random number generation, which is just uh, rand equals dot rand, and then use this in a table to shuffle our deck. That's one way we could do it. But another way we could do it is we could say, let me do an index function. So now I'm going to imagine we are in universe. This is our actual data, although it's now been put in order. I want to do a random number generation count. This time I'm going to do a thousand, imagining that we survey a thousand people and test out uh, to see whether they like it or not. And I'm going to use our random number generation to sample the survey to, to, to simulate the survey. And I'm going to use an index function. So I'm going to say, give me an index of all of these, which are which has 1,000 yeses and 4,000 noes, and then give me return to me a random number generation between uh, one and 5,000. That means between row one and row 5,000. And that should give me a random number generation, as you can see here, uh, fr from that population of data. So now that's going to be our sample. So that's what we have in universe. Now we're saying, okay, this is our sample. Let's build up our confidence interval calculations from that. So we're going to say that first I'll take N. N represents the count or the number of our sample. So if I do that with a formula in Excel, it would be count. Notice if I count these cells, I can't use just a normal count because that only counts cells with numbers in it. So in Excel, I have to use a count A. And that will count anything that has basically any letters in it and what anything in it, in essence. And there's 1,000. So we have a sample of 1,000. So P uh, represents yes. So we can represent the yes as basically a percent, a percent P. Now, first to get the percent, I have to count the P's. So I would then say we could use a count if function, meaning I'm going to tell Excel, take this column of yeses and nos and count if comma, there's a criteria of this is pointing to where I had a yes in a cell. If it says yes, and it found 178 out of 1000 yeses. Now, if I know that that number uh, is correct and that we had 1000 total sample, I could take 1000 minus 178. That means the nose must be 822 because the only possible response was yes or no. Now, you know, you're going to have people saying maybe I want to say maybe I kind of liked it or I didn't. I give it like a three. And it's like, no, that's this is a binomial survey. OK, it's either yes or no. It's either yes or no. You have to pick one or else you're going to mess up my whole thing. OK, so we only accept uh, yeses and nos here on the binomial survey. But I'd rather get a test. So I in practice. As an accountant, I'd rather have like a double check of my numbers. Therefore, I would do another count if of all of these count if it comes out to no gives me 822. And then I add those two up and it should come up to 1000, the total size of the sample. And that gives me again, like kind of an another double check. Now, notice if we had a non binomial distribution, we would have a set of numbers over here typically, such as one through 10 being the survey. 
And we said we did that last time where everybody gave it like like a three was the average, which I still think is kind of high for most of the stuff they're making these days. I mean, if if they made a movie out of the script of this one note, I think it would rate higher, like I say, than than the average movie. Uh, if they just you know put some AI behind it or something, uh, but they didn't change my script, keep the script the same, then they, it would do better. But let's so so but so and that in that we were taking the mean or average of the data. But here there's only two numbers, yes or no. I'm not going to take the average of yeses and nos, right? What I'm going to do is just take the average is basically the percent of the one I'm looking at. In this case, yeses. So my main P then, which is basically equivalent to the mean, if it was multiple numbers that we're going to be using, is going to be 178 divided by 1000 is going to be, if I move two decimals over, 17.8. That, of course, means that the no's are 822 over 1000 or 82%. Or in other words, I could get that number by taking 100% minus 17, one, you know, 17 17.8 would be the 82%. Or in other words, these two add up to 100%. Okay, given that, overkill on that one. Now, these are just tests to see whether or not we should be able to use a, a bell-shaped curve. Because you will recall that with a binomial distribution, the actual data can't be bell-shaped because a histogram of yeses and nos is just going to have two bars and not a bell shape. So we need to make sure that the central limit theorem kind of kicks in and these are tests to do that, meaning n times p is over 5. So n is the sample size, 1000 times p, which is going to be this, the percent here, which is 0.178, and that's over 5. So that's good. That's true. I did a logic test to, to say this cell is greater than 5 and I made it green if it was true with a conditional formatting. I'll show you how to do that in Excel if you want to check that out. One minus P is this one, right? Those are the no's, one minus P because 100% minus the P percent, 17.8%. So, th so the test here is just gonna be N, which is 1000 times one minus P, which was 0.822, this number over here, and that's greater than five. So we should be good. We should be able to use the bell-shaped curve to approximate our data, the central limit theorem, kick it in. All right, so then we're gonna say the confidence interval, 95%, once again, that's a generic number. That's kind of like the default number we'll typically use, which basically means that when I have my bell shape, we have a confidence interval that we're generating, meaning we're 95% confident that it will be within this interval. And that means that by chance alone, we have a 5% confidence that it will be outside in the blue area because it's symmetric. That means that we, we have a 2.5 on either side of uh, the tails over here is the general idea. All right, so 95%. Now, if we wanted more confidence, then of course I can bring this up to 96%, 97%, 99%. What's that going to do to my graph over here? It's going to it's going to increase the confidence interval. The range is going to get larger, meaning we lose specificity. We have a bigger range, less specific, but it's more going to be more confident because it's more likely that the actual result will fall in the range because we have a wider range. And then we're going to take 100% minus the 95% or whatever we put there. If it wasn't 95% means that we have a significance level of 5% representing the amounts that are outside the middle, the blue bits on the side. And then we're going to say that one end, one of the blue bits is going to have an area of the 2.5%, 5 divided by 2. Okay, so now I'm going to look at my Z's. So why are the Z's important? I'm looking for the upper Z, which means I want this side up here uh, in terms of Z scores, noting that I have two axes down below, two X axis, two descriptors of the X axis, either in Z's 
which are standard deviations, which means the middle point is zero. And then we go standard deviations to the left, standard deviations to the right. If I want to, if I want 95% of the data in the middle, we have about a little under two standard deviations to the left and to the right. If, and then I can also measure it in terms of X's, which I can convert the, stand, the, the standard deviation to the X over here and see what's my X number to the left and the right that would define my range. All right, so, so we have then uh, the upper Z. So how do we calculate the upper Z? We're gonna take the norm.dist, I mean, sorry, norm.s.inverse. This is the Excel function of one minus, and then we're gonna be picking up the one minus the probability, and the probability is this 2.5, the 2.5. Now, the reason it's one minus, if it wasn't one minus, we would end up with the left end, which would be, a, which would be symmetrical, negative 1.96. But I'm, I have one minus the probability to get to the top end, and that's the Z at that upper end, uh, of, at the upper end. And then we can calculate uh, the standard error. Now, you will call, recall the standard error is kind of like the standard deviation that we're using to create our curve over here because the standard deviation of the actual population is is going not going to be bell shaped it's going to be uh it's going to have just two bars the standard deviation of the actual of the sample also might simulate the standard deviation of the actual data but it's not going to be bell shaped but if we imagine that we took every combination of sample sizes in our case of 1000 out of the population of 5000 and we took the average of all those the p's of all those we can imagine that it would tend towards a bell-shaped curve and that's going to be the standard error that we're going to be looking for which was before if it wasn't a binomial distribution the formula was that it was going to be the standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of n or the sample. But in this case, because we have a binomial experiment, this is in essence our formula, the square root, I'm just looking at this side of it because this is giving us a range, it's gonna be the square root of P, which is the percent of the one we're looking at and the percent yeses in our case times one minus P, which is gonna be the percent of the one we're not kind of focused on, the percent of no's in our case, divided by the, n which is going to be the sample uh in our case uh was was the 1000 and taking the square root of all of that all right so that's going to be did i have a, a little formula so it's the square root which is given in excel with a square root formula of the p which is the 17.8 percent times one minus p 82.2 two percent divided by uh n uh, which was the 1,000, and it's taking the square root of the entire thing. And that's going to give us then the 0 0.012096. All right, so then we can calculate our margin of error. So you will recall, what's the margin of error? Well, we have the middle point now in terms of Zs, which would be zero, and then in terms of Xs, which is the is the mean, or it's, it's P, right? And then we can measure how far up we go on each side, which we measured in standard deviations, otherwise known as, as Z's in a, uh, in a normal distribution. And we said it was about two or 1.96 in order to get 95% in the middle. Now we wanna convert that Z calculation to X's to see how far up that point would be uh, in, in X's. So what this distance is in essence, not in Z's or standard deviations, but rather and X's. So what I do is I take then the standard error, which is kind of like our, our spread calculation, 0 0.012096 about times the standard deviations. We need 1.96, almost two of them, gives us the 0 0.023708. So now we can take the middle point. If it was the middle point in Z's, it would be zero, but we want the middle point in X's, which would be, or P's, if you want to call it that, which would be the 17. 
So this is the middle point of our graph. It's going to be kind of like the average, the mean 0.178. And then uh, the range is going to be that, if I pull this down, minus then the standard error of the 0 0.023708 gives us the 0 0.154292. And then the upper bit is going to be the middle, the mean 0.178 plus the margin of error 0 0.023708 gives us about 201708. So these two sides then are going to be about, you know, 15 0.4 and 20.17 if I go over here so f here about 15.4 I'm now looking at x and 20 something 20.2017 about on this side so I think that's about right so there's there's our range and the middle point we said was what 17.8 17.8 so that's about right Sounds about right. I made these numbers up, but I think these are pretty accurate for the for the current TV shows. Like I say, I mean, it's just astounding the decline the decline uh, in quality. With, with, I mean, just take a book. Just take just take a classic book and then make cool stuff. Don't change the script. Don't change the script. You guys can't write. You guys can't write. Like, I swear, it's crazy. Just make it, just make it look good. Stop trying to rewrite the thing. You guys don't know what you, you don't know how to write anything. Anyways, whatever, dude. So if this, so now I'm going to take the Z's, which are negative four, and then to positive four. So this time I'm going to build my graph by taking four. Now, why did I go negative four to the positive four? Because if I measure this in Z's, you will recall that if it's a normal distribution, about 95% will be within two standard deviations. But I want the entire graph on there. And, and so most of the stuff will be in there within three standard deviations, and all of it should be in there within four standard deviations. That's why I'm choosing four Zs, four standard deviations. Then once I have that, I can calculate the X. So if I know what the Z is, if the Z is negative four, I can take my standard error, which is my standard deviations for the graph, 0 0.012096 times four, we're negative four, which would be that. And then I'm gonna take that uh, minus my uh, middle, minus the middle here, which is the 0.178. And that's where we get to the 0.1296. So we repeat that process for all of the X's. I just copy that formula down and there's our x's and then we've got the p of x this is calculated as norm.dist of the x which is now this number comma the mean which is this number the 17.8 our p and then we've got the standard deviation which is going to be our standard error number and then is it cumulative no therefore zero and it gives us our percentages and so that gives me enough to graph it, but not enough to get these little blue bits on the end. So then I'm going to say in order to get the blue bits on the end and these two X uh, ways to see the X, I need another set of data. So I'm going to say, I want you to give me the X's that are between these two numbers. Now, this is a dynamic formula in Excel. I'll show you how to do it if you want to see this in Excel with a longer presentation in Excel. But it's basically saying... I want the X to be greater than the lower limit and less than the upper limit, which means I'm graphing the middle part. I could have set it up this way. I want the Z to be greater than a negative 1.96 and less than the upper or positive 1.96, right? And then I'd have to graph that and I can use a function to graph that, which would be a logic test. And it would say in this cell, I'd be saying, if and then an and because I have two logic tests I want to be putting into place and I'm going to say I want you to take uh, this cell and that cell has to be uh, greater than the than this number and then comma the next logic test in the and function is to take this cell and make it it has to be less than this number and then close up the and function here 
And then the what and then what do you want us to do if that is true? That's what this argument is. I want you to give me this number. And what do you want us to do if it's false? I want you to leave it blank, which I'm going to indicate by a space, which is indicated by text field quotes and a space. And then you can't see the anything graphed here because it's way down. It'd be past this point. And I didn't copy it all over because it gets all wonky when I do that. But that graphs out the middle part, which is the orange bit here. So now we've got our graph that we can look at and we can basically say, okay, does this make sense? Well, the middle point should be in Z's at zero once again. In terms of X's, it should be at the 17.8. So 17.8 in this middle point. And then we should have the range that we're putting around it around the 2.96 or so in Z's as we saw. And then it's giving us the the ranges in X is 0.154 and 0.201. So 0.154 about and 0.201. So that means 95% in the middle. We accept 5% chance, even by chance alone, that the range is not encompassing the actual uh, number. Uh, and that's the idea. So if we look at over here and just test it out, is it this is our range. What's the actual number of the population? We said the actual number of the population uh, was 20% uh, 20, 20 yes. So 20% yes. And so it's on, so it's within the range. It's a little bit out there because notice I, I got a population of 17.8 uh, yeses which is actually a little low because the actual population is 20. And then our range is basically, it's is the actual population is at 20, which is cutting it a little bit close, but still within the range. Now, if I, re if I reshuffle this number a bunch of times, which in Excel I'm able to do because I let these cells uh, regenerate themselves, then uh, you would expect like 5% of the time that, that this range will not contain the actual 20 within it. And, and that's gonna be by basically chance alone. How do I lower the odds of that happening? I make this 95% bigger, which would make this 5% the tails of the graph smaller, which means that the confidence range would be larger, less specific, but less likely to have, uh, to not contain the actual result by uh, chance alone. So the bottom line is, uh, that's how you do it. And, and like, I, like I say, the movie industry, like I honestly think they could take the script, you just take the script of this, and I'm not letting you change it, right? If you wanna, if you wanna make this script into a movie, you can't change it. I, you have to keep it the same and then do the, and then do all the cool stuff to it that you're good at doing, like the scenery, and the and the green screen and stuff and and i swear it'll do better than a, like a lot of the stuff you're making because you keep messing up the script which is that you're really bad at that it you're really bad at that so if you do just try that i'm telling you